Last week we began a two-part sermon series entitled, Coming Out of the Darkness of Depression. In the first half, last Sunday, we really spent the entire Sunday talking about what are the things that we should not be doing that lead us to depression. And if you haven't listened to this sermon, it's one of the most downloaded sermons, by the way, that we've ever done in our church, by the way. Just encourage you, go on and listen to this sermon. If you are someone that is in a season of depression or despair, or maybe have someone that is, definitely share this link with someone else. But today I want to build on that sermon and give you all a little bit of hope, a little bit of encouragement in our own walk of faith, and talk to you today about turning on the light of Christ. All of us in our lives will face a season of darkness, despair, and sadness. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. For you, maybe it is you've been praying and praying for a relationship to get better, and it's not. Maybe for some others of you, maybe you're in that season because you lost someone that you love so much, and you simply can't get past it. It's so hard on you, the loss of that loved one. Maybe for some of you, you feel like you've got nowhere to go, no one to lean on. You just kind of think that you have nothing to offer this world. And so often, because we don't have the tools to deal with those seasons of depression, those seasons of despair, oftentimes we will struggle on our own. We'll allow ourselves to live more in our head than in our faith. We'll allow ourselves to isolate ourselves from people. We kind of have a, we're kind of fearful of the stigma it comes across to say that, hey, I need some help or I'm not okay or maybe I'm even depressed. We'll simply just isolate and withdraw ourselves. In 1996, I went to the seminary. Many of you may not know this story, but when I went to the seminary, I was on fire for Christ. I thought when I was going to the seminary, it was going to be heaven on earth. But when I went there, I have to be honest with you, I struggled, especially early on, greatly. A master's program at the seminary is not two or three classes that you would see at a typical master's program every semester. At the seminary, it's seven and eight classes. One third of my class quit within the very first semester. It's a very taxing academic degree. To make matters worse, when I got there, I thought that there was a whole bunch of cliques, and I couldn't, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't penetrate any of those cliques. There were a certain group of people that were like this, and then a certain people that were like that. No matter how hard I tried, I couldn't get involved. I couldn't get engaged in that. To make matters even more worse, at that time, my dad's brother, his wife, and my grandmother were all diagnosed with cancer around the same exact time. They'd all be battling cancer, and these were people that spoke life into me, especially my grandmother. As I started journeying day after day, as I got into my very first semester, I ended up dealing with this in some of the most unhealthy ways. This is how it would go. I would leave church, the chapel, which we'd go to every single day, every morning and every night. I'd go to the cafeteria, get my food to go, and then go into my room, in my little dorm room that was no bigger than some of our walk-in closets, and simply just eat my lunch, my breakfast, by myself. Day after day after day. I just simply withdrew myself more and more. I was in a season of darkness and sadness. One day in the middle of September, I was leaving the chapel, just like I always did, on my way to the cafeteria to get my to-go food, to go eat in my little dorm room all by myself. And off to the distance, I would see my mother and my father. They had surprised me that day, simply flying from Jacksonville to Boston to be with me. I'd love to tell you that I was so grateful and happy to see them, but I began to cry profusely. I was in a season of so much despair that I was simply crying out for help. My dad came running towards me. He said, Nick, what's going on? Why are you so upset? I said, Dad, I don't think this is for me. I don't think I can make it. My dad looked at me, and my dad wasn't a very theological person. He didn't have these great statements that he would say or statements that would just change my life. But he simply looked at me and he said, Nick, if you want to go, we're going to go. But he said, you need to make sure of one thing. You can't live this way. You need to get closer to God and get close to someone to help you through this. 
You need to get closer to God, and you need to get to someone, close to someone, who will inspire you. Can I just do that for you all today? Would you just allow me to inspire all of you today that if you're in a season of depression or a season of sadness, or maybe you're just in a season of just despair, do not let the weeds of depression, despair, and sadness choke the joy out of your life. But let the seeds of faith, hope, and love guide you in your walk of life. 10% of life is what happens to you. 90% is how you respond to it. Last week I mentioned to you in the Bible how the Bible is riddled with people that were not perfect people. People that just like you and I that struggle in their own walk of faith, in their own walk of life. Paul was a murderer and God made him the greatest missionary. But there was one person in the Old Testament, just like Paul in the New Testament, who struggled with despair, sadness, and depression. His name was Elijah. He's one of the greatest of prophets. In fact, in our church, as we begin in September, um, beginning fundraising of our iconography, in the church, in the Orthodox Church's tradition, in the dome is, yes, an icon of Christ, but it is, by, it is the tradition of the church that there are the prophets that are simply leaning towards Christ. They are pointing towards Christ. Elijah is one of those prophets. Here he was a man, like many of us, on fire for Christ. You could say that he was coming to church. At times he would even hear the words of God. One occasion he was defeating, he was defeating two little people called Baal and Ashura. These were two gods that many of the people there at that time would worship. Elijah, just like that, defeated them through God. He was on fire for Christ. One time, there was a drought for three years. Elijah said, God, let it rain. And it rained. Been not had rained for three years. We kind of feel like that here in Jacksonville. It hasn't rained enough here. He was on fire for Christ. But then there was this guy named King Ahab. Remember this. And King Jezebel. And Queen Jezebel. Jezebel says to her King Ahab, we need to get this guy, Elijah. He's gaining in power. Now, they weren't people of faith. We need to get him. They simply sent word to other people to tell Elijah that, hey, we're coming after you. That simple threat caused Elijah to not say, I'm strong in the Lord. I can handle anything that comes up against me. No, Elijah ran. And in 1 Kings chapter 18 and 19, I encourage all of you, one of the most powerful stories in the Old Testament, in chapters 18 and 19 of 1 Kings, it says that Elijah was sitting under the tree. And if you're all familiar with this, you'll know. But he says, Lord, listen to this prayer. Take my life, because I don't want to live it anymore. That's a prophet who heard the words of God. Take my life. He was in a season of despair, sadness, and depression. He allowed the weeds to take the joy out of his life. The story doesn't end there. He ends up doing extraordinary things in his life. But I'm, what I'm encouraging all of you is to know that when we face these seasons, that you're not alone. It's okay for you not to be okay. So what do we do about it? What are some practical steps that you and I can take today that not if, but when those seasons of darkness, depression, despair come in your life and in my life, what are we to do? If you're new to St. John the Divine, one thing that you will know is that part of my job is not to simply give you a nice sermon. I need to give you the steps to apply it on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You're investing your time in this worship. I need to be able to give you a return on your investment. And every Sunday, we try to give you practical steps that you can apply in your walk of faith. So if you want to write these down, go ahead. Here's number one. If you want to turn the light on in the darkness of your depression... Take care of yourself. The greatest commodity you have is not how much money you have in your 401k that's now a 101k, by the way, but it's a joke, everyone. <laughs> the greatest commodity that you have right now is not in your houses, it's not in your car, it's not how much money you have in your checking account. Look at me, everyone. The greatest commodity you have is time. Tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. Time is wasting. And for many of us, if you don't prioritize, look at me, everyone, if you don't prioritize your life, 
someone else will. Let me say it again. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Outside these doors, they are telling you what needs to be your priority. And for many of us, we're so busy. I heard someone say, if you're burning the candle from both ends, you're not that bright. Some of us are just that way. We're kind of burning it from both ends. I shared with you several months ago in a sermon that the word busy and the letters that make it up, B-U-S-Y, stands for I am bound under Satan's yoke. And for many of us, God will keep you so, the devil will keep you so busy in your life that you cannot spend time taking a break in your life. And so I'm just encouraging you all, take better care. What does that look like? Like today, take a nap. Like I'm telling you, take a nap. Don't do all these to-dos today. I'm giving you, husbands, I'm giving you permission. (laughs) Take it off. Go for a walk. Hold your wife by the hand. Say, we're going to go for a walk, honey. When she passes out, you simply lift her up. (laughs) Say, we're walking again. But take the time to spend with her. Wives, the same way. I have had four funerals in the last two weeks. People way too young who have gone to be with the Lord. And in those moments, friends, people are not talking about emails to check or meetings to go to or social media that I need to check up on. No, they're losing their loved ones. I love how the Bible says, Lord, say, the, the book of Psalms says this, I love this prayer. Lord, teach me to number my days. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says this great statement. Remember this, it says, better to have one handful and peace of mind than two handfuls and you're chasing the wind. And how many of us are just trying to hoard and hoard more work, more work, and all we're doing is chasing the wind. We need to take better care of ourselves. Here's number two. I want you to turn the light on by taking a step closer to Christ. Every morning when you get up, There is a voice on your shoulder from the enemy that when you're in that season of darkness and depression saying, you know what? Don't go to church. Stay by yourself. You don't want to open the blinds? Keep them closed. Don't tell anyone that you're going through all this. Just simply go through life. You're okay. Then there's another voice. That's the voice of Christ saying, let me walk with you. Let me guide you. Involve me in your life. Invite me into your life. And who you listen to the most in your life has power over your life. Let me ask you, who you've been listening to recently? Because you got to know that the devil's not going to come in front of you with a pitchfork and a red cape. He's going to come into the voices that are in your mind. And so my encouragement for all of you is, Lord, I need to get closer to you. It's great that you're in church on Sunday. But don't let it be an hour and a half or two hours of worship on a, during, the, during the week. Every day, Lord, I want to get closer to you. I am prone in the sadness and the depression to listen to that wrong voice. I just want to make you my priority. The Bible says, be still and hear and know that I am God. Some of us simply just need to be still to hear the right voice that's speaking to all of us. And here's number three. We take better care of ourselves. We take a better step towards Christ. And number three, take inventory of your friends. If there's one area that many of us underestimate, it's who we're hanging around with. Some of us are simply hanging around people just simply by default. Well, they're just in my life. It's my friend of mine. Known them for years and years. I see them in church. I see them all the time. They're family members. It's great to have a lot of acquaintances But you need to have people, listen to me, that make you better. Said differently, that make you closer to who Christ wants you to be than you are right now. I'm going to invite myself and say, I'm one of those people. But you need to have other people who are challenging you to be better. Who you associate with is who's guiding your life. And I'm worried sometimes that we're going to get to the end of our life saying, God, I did my best. And God's going to look at you and say, what do you mean you did your best? Who are you hanging around with? Did you think that you were going to be any different than them? Take the time. If they're part of your life, I say this respectfully, they can be acquaintances, but don't allow them to be your friends. You've got to find people 
that are making you more into the image that Christ made you. And if not, I love you, but I need to find people that are doing just that. I'll leave you with this. On May 8th, 1945, it was the end of one of the most horrific things in human history. It was the end of what we call today the Holocaust. 6.5 million people lost their lives in some of the most excruciating ways. They were people that were thrown into the gas chamber. They were men, women, and children whose bodies were mutilated and used for experimentation. They were people who starved to death. And then there were another three and a half million people who saw all that happening and who experienced it, but they didn't die, they lived. And for many of those 3.5 million people, and it's extraordinary if you read the studies about it, during the years following the Holocaust, many, many Jewish people committed suicide because of what they saw and experienced at the Holocaust. There was a well-known psychologist named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl opened a clinic in Austria. And what he did in this clinic is he started to begin, bring all of these Holocaust survivors into his clinic to kind of guide them through the, what they had experienced and what they saw. And as he was meeting with them time and time again, many of them on the verge of simply taking their own life, he told them that there's more to live and that do not allow yourselves to make a permanent decision on a temporary problem. And listen to what he says. He said, many people have enough to live by, but nothing to live for. They have the means, but they have no meaning in their life. For many of us, we buy into the lie that the purpose of life, look at me everyone, is pleasure. The purpose of life is not pleasure. That's in the kingdom to come. The purpose of life is your purpose. And what Viktor Frankl found is that the more that he gave these people a purpose to live for, the more that they were coming out of that season of darkness. What the enemy wants you to do in your season of darkness is to not fulfill God's purpose over your life. But can I tell you something? Depression cannot grow in a giving heart. Let me say that again. Depression cannot grow in a giving heart. And my encouragement for all of you today is to go out. And if you're in this season of darkness, turn the light on. Turn the light on by taking better care of yourself. If you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. Turn on the light by getting closer to Christ. St. Paisio says, the problem in the world today is that we forgot to put God at the center of our lives. And turn the light on, every one of you by knowing and having friends that make you better. Don't allow the weeds of depression, despair, and sadness steal the joy of Christ in your life, but God's seeds of faith, hope, and love, let it guide all of your lives. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.